sight defines our universe. We measure the vast distances across galaxies from one to the next using light. The Andromeda galaxy is our closest spiral galaxy, our neighbor, some two and a half million light years away, measured in light. The time it took the light to travel from Andromeda to Earth, human evolution had taken place. We'd started our march towards the moon. These are huge distances. Light has played an important part of humanity from the real beginnings of our species. In the depths of caves in France and Lascaux, some 17,300 years ago, early humans chose to bring light to the depths of caves to record life on Earth. Thankfully, I don't have to travel to the depths of caves to record life on Earth. It makes life rather complicated. But even in the sixth century, the alphabet was one which was written in shadows, again, cast by light. This cuneiform text tells a wonderful story of poor old Nabonidus, who's been smited by King Cyrus. And it's recorded beautifully in shadows. Without light, we cannot read this text. As history moves on, though, and alphabets develop, we start using other materials to record information. Not least, King John's Magna Carta, written here beautifully in Gorlink. Gorlink that started its life as chemical warfare within trees. A tree saying, get lost, to a wasp that was trying to lay its eggs. So as the larvae develops, a gall grows around it. But this gall, which is grown by the tree, is rich in iron, the, the tree's defense system. And it makes a wonderful ink, an ink that we can record information that can be passed from generation to generation through time. In this case, a very powerful document telling every single person should be treated the same under the laws of the land, even the king. You used to have one of those, apparently. We, <laughs> we also collate this information into libraries. I love libraries. This, I think of as my hard copy drive. It doesn't ever crash. No one can really get into it, and it's very safe. We love books. Books record our history, the wealth of information that we have brought together through time. And we can share it wonderfully and through the pages. It's very easy to flick through and learn about our own species and other species and how we have populated our planet. My library, which I have to flick through the pages of, is quite different. It's pretty tough to read. It's literally written in stone. The disjointed fossil sentences that I have to reconstruct to bring life back from the past can be tough sometimes. A whole sentence I dream of, occasional words and the odd letter is often all we have to bring back past life. Here as we're casting the last embers of the sun of the day on the Zollenhofen limestone in southern Bavaria, it, it does make me think maybe by casting light onto fossils we can learn more. And this is precisely what my team and I have been doing for the last few years. We have been looking at casting a light, not visible light that we'd expect from the sun, but one of the brightest lights in the universe. This light is made by us humans. It's in a particle accelerator. The light is in the form of x-rays. The x-rays generated here at the Diamond Light Source in the UK and multiple light sources around the world have driven the electronic revolution, which is why you all have to silence your cell phones today. But we use light which is generated from, in this case, a package of electrons which are going to be accelerated into this booster ring. The booster ring does all the wonderful work. It brings this package of particles using powerful magnets to relativistic speeds. Again, literally just below the speed of light before it punctures out into the outer storage ring, still being bent continuously in its path by these powerful magnets. It is through this immense energy being put into this system that energy is shed by these particles in the form of intense x-rays. These are the x-rays which we shine onto our experiments 
to learn something of the very building blocks that construct the fossils that we're studying. But we didn't start our studies by looking at fossils. Initially, it was manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, where the text was so faint, we could excite the very atoms of iron within the gall ink so that we could read those texts. Sometimes, we could even see a tantrum and reverse a tantrum. This is Cherubini's beautiful aria, The Passion That Consumes Me. And what is wonderful about this particular piece of music is he was told his operas were too long. And in a fit of pique, now people did say he was very even-tempered. He was basically angry all the time. This music is remarkable because you're one of the largest audience to hear it. Because it, this piece of manuscript was brought up to the beamline at Stanford. And one of my colleagues placed it on the beamline and we could put the x-rays through that blurred image on the left and read the music through both potassium and iron that was rich within the music that had been written by Cherubini. So we literally can pick apart something that we were never meant to see. What about life on Earth? What might we see if we start picking apart fossils? I'm not expecting a symphony, but I would like some more information, the more than what visible light can give us. We started looking for the chemistry of pigmentation, something we know a lot about. Melanin pigment is one of the most dominant pigments in the world. The dark feathers on the back of this bird are a function of a particular process giving rise to this dark melanin pigment. And the feathers you see on the screen now are colored by distinct chemistry, which under X-ray vision, you all now become Superman and woman, instantly. And you now all see just zinc. And in this case, the zinc coordinates on the feathers with the distribution of particular types of melanin. So there is a key compound there that we can map in a living animal. Can we push that back in deep time, though? Well, we've got to remember that it's not just pigments that give color. Carotenoids from plants, which can be sequestered through the food chain from the plant, the shrimp, eventually into the diet of this flamingo to give these wonderful colored feathers. They can also be porphyrins. If I put on my x-ray specs and I'd look at this audience now and I wanted to see iron, I'd see your cardiovascular systems probably at rest, unlike mine. And you'll see the heme of blood, that cofactor in blood racing through your body. But here, the cofactor in this particular type of pigment is giving these fantastic greens. And then there's structural color as well. Color is a complicated matter. Here, little pockets of air within the keratin of the feather gives you these fantastic blues and greens. But pigment is something we can match in terms of patination with this chemistry. I'm not trying to unpick the full palette of life on Earth. We have to start somewhere, and we did with pigments. On this beautiful fossil of Archaeopteryx, 150 million years old from Zonhofen in Bavaria, when we look at it under X-ray vision of the synchrotron light at Stanford, we're able to see, now you're looking through phosphorus glasses, your bones are all rich in calcium and phosphorus. Here, the phosphorus is screamingly rich within the bones, but also within the feathers, the rachises, that central barb of the feathers. It's been preserved since the Jurassic period. That is astounding. It stayed put for a huge period of time. If you want to bury something nasty in the ground tomorrow, say in your backyard, and you want it to stay put because you don't want it going into the water supply, you must really understand what happens when you put that material in the ground. It's hard to run an experiment for 100 or 1,000 years. These have been running for millions of years. They give us hindsight of what happens when things are placed in the ground that might inform us how to manage our environment today. We look further into the feathers of another beautiful fossil from the lower Cretaceous of China, in this case, Confucius Ornus Sanctus. It's a beautiful fossil bird. And when we scan that at the synchrotron, very rapidly, the f it's amazing this bright light. It only has to touch the fossil for the millisecond to give us a signal. And we don't damage the fossil in this process, which is very helpful. Curators still speak to me, which is great. But what you're looking at there on the left is a composite image of copper in red, blue in the bones, calcium, 
And this beautiful zinc surround is from the volcanic ash-rich deposits where this animal died. The copper in its feathers are interesting. The sulfur in the feathers on the right are also fascinating. I have fond memories of my brother setting fire to my hair. Yes, I used to have hair. But when he did, I had this horrible smell of eggs. And that is the cysteine and cysteine, the sulfur compounds in my hair, burning. It is still present after 120 million years in this fossil. And it's been protected by a trace metal jacket of copper. The copper is from a particular molecule. That molecule is this remarkable compound of eumelanin. Anyone with dark hair in this audience and brown eyes, you have this molecule, you synthesize this in your body. And we were able to identify and spatially map this across ancient remains to reconstruct what these organisms might have looked like. But it also provides a very useful roadmap, and we work with people who are looking into melanomas, when melanin production goes a little bit awry. And this creates too much of the material in the system, and it becomes cancerous, it's not good. Here is your roadmap if you want to target medicines for that particular molecule. So it's a very useful product from studying fossils. We also look at how sick dinosaurs can be. And they are wonderfully sick, but they healed. If we could heal in the way dinosaurs did, we would be very, very happy organisms. Us mammals are not so hot at it. These could recover from huge traumas. And by studying how their bones chemically recovered from that trauma, because they use the same ingredients that we use, they are vertebrates like us. So if we can pick apart the recipe from when a dinosaur, in this case, has stubbed its toe, on the top of this bone is a fracture callus, that little sliver of bone shaped like an eye. When we look at it under, under synchrotron light, those purple hints, a little hint of purple, represents zinc. And that's osteoblast activity. That's a cell responsible for growth of new bone. It's healing. So we can map the ingredients. It's a bit like being given a recipe book. Now, if I'm given a recipe book and I have to use the exact same ingredients as my mum, my mum makes something and it's edible. I, on the other hand, can burn water. So it, it, it's not what you do, not what, you, what ingredients you have, it's what you can do with them. And that's what we're trying to learn through this work. But as a strange byproduct of studying some of the Jurassic bones from some parts of the US, is that they were really hot. And I mean hot in a very positive way. They were rich in uranium. The bone has formed a natural mop, and this jumped out at us, literally. This is a great quote, Isaac Asimov, great moments in science are rarely met with the words eureka, but usually with the words, hmm, that's funny. <laughs> that's the moment. And, and, and it's at this moment we realize that bones might form a wonderful biological mop for some nasty radioactive materials that we want to lock safely through deep time and bury in our backyards. So it's a very powerful imaging technique that's been developed using synchrotron light. So my laboratory is one that you might expect for a good part of the year. I love going into the badlands of South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, there are more people in this audience than there are in my field area in a lifetime. So it's beautiful. But this is the other half of my life. This is the yin and yang of paleontology today. Without one, we can't have the other. And it's what's happening in synchrotron light sources today is genuinely creating a tipping point for my science. When we shine light on fossils, we can learn something about our past, but more importantly, we can learn something about our future. Thank you. Thank you.